I remember distinctly as a kid spending a lot of time on my aunt's farm outside of a small village of Heidelberg where we grew up and she had a farm, animals, vegetables, and I remember the smells and her cooking. And to this day, every time I eat a cherry tomato or a green bean or I smell hay, it immediately takes me back. What got me interested in the Boku store, I was a young cook and I was watching a documentary of Canadian chef Robert Sladeke, who competed for Canada. And I remember just being really inspired watching that. And I knew that one day I'm gonna compete in this competition. I see the Boku's competition like the Olympics of cuisine. One athlete, a chef, who will be on the podium cooking for five and a half hours. To cook for your country is a monster responsibility because it says who we are. It's not only a competition, it's not about the winning, it's about representing. The Boku Store is a competition that was created by Paul Bocuse as a way to bring chefs out from behind the scenes and into the spotlight. Paul Bocuse for me is uh, one of the most famous chefs in the world, if not the most famous chef in the world. He created the cuisine that was uh, second to none. And for about 50 years, he's had three-star Michelin restaurants. So he was a focused man, but he was definitely a showman as well. Why is it because it's so important? Very simple. Premier culinary competition worldwide. It's just not all about French cuisine. It's uh, different countries bringing their touch to a cuisine that's been around for a long, long time. It's so important for us to partake in this global challenge. It's the pinnacle of food competition. If we want to maintain that presence in the world of food, Canada needs to keep pushing to be on that world stage. In my opinion, Trevor is the right person to do this competition. 
is young, passionate, he has a lot of energy, lots of experience as well. I know Trevor for over 20 years now. He was my book who's comment in Vancouver many moons ago. And he was a young, young, young man. He had great work ethic. Throughout the years, Trevor's been nothing but a surprise in his growth. Trevor was the right candidate because you need someone who's got passion and someone who wants to get there. And you know, he needs all the tools to get there as well. But he had that drive and that motivation and perseverance. My name is Trevor Ritchie. I'm a chef technologist at George Brown College. I was born in Brantford, Ontario, but spent most of my time growing up in Kitchener, Waterloo. I first realized I was interested in cooking at the age of 15. Working at this restaurant in a small village, St. Jacob's, nice little restaurant, and at the end of service as a dishwasher, I had to take the garbage out at the end of the day. I had all these garbage bags full of uh, whatever, in my hands and then walked out the back to the to the dumpster and there wasn't a ladder or a staircase and I remember just about like here all these hot veal bones you know just broke through the bag and next thing I know I had a face full of garbage. Next day I go in talk to the chef sit down just about to give my notice and before I got a chance to he asked me do you want to start prepping? Would you like to start doing some prep jobs? Peeling vegetables, slicing, making salads. Would you be interested in that? And I said, well, absolutely, that's great, for sure. Everything was so exciting to me. I started off just peeling carrots and dicing onions, and that was so much fun. And I had, for some reason, I loved always doing the basic things. I always had in mind that I want to compete at the Boku store. So what I did, is I knew that I needed to work at the best restaurants I could find. I knew that I needed to get involved in competitions. So I went after everything I possibly could. The competition is a three stages process. Trevor won last year the national competition against other chefs coast to coast. He ended up winning the first place, giving him the chance to represent our country. Winning the national selection was really exciting. It took a couple days to sink in. Moving on towards the continental selection, the skill level is, is even higher. This competition is more than just winning the first place. It's about working together in the same country to make our cuisine be better and to promote it worldwide. The commie role in the kitchen is, is very important for a lot of reasons. You need to have strong people around you. This is so much more than just cooking. I'm training every day, working for the biggest competition in the culinary world. So I need to have somebody that doesn't just have the skills, but that has the drive, that has the mentality, that has the endurance to go through and withstand the pressures that the contest demands. The Kami Chef in the Boku store is essentially an extension of the candidate. So we all work together to develop our recipes and develop our program, and in a way I sort of fill the gaps. Kami Chef would generally do more of the basic prep. But as it pertains to the Boku store, it's, it's definitely elevated. That role it becomes more increasingly important. And uh, they're full on, you know, producing incredible, highly delicate foods. I was just finishing my program and my chef at the time knew that Trevor was looking for someone and she got us in touch. I could tell by the way that she carried herself and her professionalism, even by the way that she moved very graceful, serious, but also had a very positive presence. That was everything that I was looking for. It makes me feel very lucky to be working under someone who is so patient, but so passionate and so driven with what he's doing. He makes sure that I'm coming out of this with more than just the result we want on the podium. It's about me growing as a chef. So to be in that position is really gratifying. Great. <laughs>
Jenna's the ballerina. When she moves, she moves really beautifully, but she's physically strong. Growing up, I was actually a competitive dancer starting from the age of three. And so my experience there, learning that discipline and also pushing myself to be the best that I could, that really showed me my competitive nature and that sort of drive to always outdo myself. I never saw myself making a career out of dance, but taking that thing from my childhood and being able to apply it in, in a whole new way to match the life that I want to have now, it's, it's really special. Cooking has always been something that's really cathartic for me. Uh, it's, it's a craft for sure, but it's also something that I find to be an art form. There's something that just feels right about being in the kitchen and getting to create something out of a raw ingredient and turning it into something that can actually evoke emotion in a person. I think it's how it stands, I, do, I would think, what next? Like, do you get the bone, like the stand, of that to lift the bone up a little bit? Or a natural curve, right? Our coach, James Olberg, was actually the last candidate representing Canada back in 2017 at the final. I know him as the coach who always told me to love what I'm cooking. That was always what he was enforcing. I'm very fortunate and very lucky and honored to have him as my coach. He has a wealth of knowledge amazing chef, more passion for the Boku store maybe than myself. The camaraderie that we have on Team Canada is something really special and unique. We have our, our president and our judge representing Canada, John Higgins, who has really guided us in developing our food. Our kitchen assistants, Nick and Kevin, they played really integral roles on the team, whether that's just making sure we always have our mise en place scaled out for the next day or helping us come up with these insane ideas to create those wow garnishes we're looking for. I couldn't imagine just Trevor and I trying to come up with those ourselves. A lot of the countries around the world are getting really strong, very talented chefs, different ideas, different flavors, different resources that they may have. They all bring something new to the table. So it's important for us to push the envelope in our design, in our food, in, in the way that we look, everything, everything that we could think of. When people see us walking in the halls, there's no question, oh, there's Team Canada. When you do the platter, it's almost like a piece of jewelry. We have multiple opportunities to wow the judges on the day of when we're competing. It's not just about when we bring out the food and it's presented to them. It's, it's about how we work and how our kitchen is set up, but one of the most important things is the platter. Everyone remembers the platter of the winning team. When looking at a platter, the judges will take a particular look at the overall aspect. Does it truly reflect your country? And then, does it all go well together? Is it symbolic? Does it represent something in particular? And it's almost like you don't have to eat the food that's on it, but you've already tasted it by looking at it. Over the long-term understanding that this has been my dream for so long and okay, now it's happening, you know, time to go. So that's when things really started to move and I got more deep involved into the process. I really started to think of what are the things that I need in order to succeed? And I started to think about what's the best team. I reached out to Luigi because I was searching for someone or a team to design our platter. So that's how it all started and then I knew that George Brown had a design school. So it was logical for me to approach them and see, would you be interested? My role was designing and managing the fabrication of the platter. Yeah, I noticed you really like this. Thomas liked it. Mm -hmm. as well, right? I like this, yeah. Right. This is proven okay. to be successful. Okay, so here's the thing. If we, sorry. One yeah, thing. If we did this uh -huh. sort of arrangement right. and had the garnishes somehow on like different levels somehow, mm -hmm. I mean, even if it was subtle, okay. that would be very impressive, I think. I'll work on that. Yeah. 
I was thinking of combining this with that ripple idea together. I so, love it. Yeah. I love it. Sean is an amazing person to work with. He's really easy uh, to talk to, a good listener, much better listener than I am. And he helps to solve problems and has a very creative way of looking at things. He really enhanced the vision of what we were trying to do. We're thinking that there's some, like, I'll, I'll tell you from our perspective, both Sean and I, like, we were looking at them all over last night trying to decide exactly which ones to show, which ones we should add. If I had to choose today, you know, like Trevor, it has to be one of these, you gotta pick it up the pace. I would say either we go two routes, either we do, we do something like this for Mexico and something like this for France, because you know I'm obsessed with the mushroom and I absolutely love this drip thing. I like the water and I love that. The platter for Mexico, we decided to go with a water theme. That was a progression from a lot of different thinking. Luigi had this idea and it was important that we were using a Canadian concept for the platter. So one of the concepts that we had was representing the Great Lakes. We are fortunate enough to have huge and massive sources of fresh water. We had this really cool idea for a Georgian Bay sort of a look, which was beautiful but finding a design that fits within the, the constraints of the competition and that really highlights the food, which is the most important. We still landed on a water theme at the end and we wanted to create something different and try to set the trends rather than follow the trends. Because that's what the Boku store is, is about. It's about what's new, what's innovative for the future. So we wanted to do something different. The most challenging of this project was the fabrication because the form that they had designed was such an unusual form in fabrication industry. It was a pioneering. So we had difficulties to find the right fabricators who were willing to do the job. And because this was a national project, many of them were willing to do that, but in terms of technology and in terms of machinery, they were short, so we had very difficult times to get them on board. It looks amazing. There are some flaws. Uh, it's for you those. No, no. <laughs> it's a rough draft, but it looks amazing. With this water concept, we decided, hey, could we do something different with the platter? Maybe we could create some layers of texture in the actual metal. So that's when we decided, hey, we've got this water theme. Why don't we do ripples of water? The idea of the ripples in the water thrown by a pebble were there to reinforce the whole idea of bringing Canada out into the world, rippling the effect of our culture, growing, helping people understand how the whole process of creating fruit is a process that starts with the rain growing onto the earth. The water ripple, I don't think it's ever been done before. Mm -hmm. that, and that's very like warming and everybody understands that. Right. We had the elevated boardwalk over the water lake of the food. We had the special cranberry ponds that the food sat on. Everything was there to put the food in relief. This competition is all about like the chic, slick, like everything high-end like as possible. The workmanship on like a wood platter is equal to a workmanship on a silver platter. The silver one wins every time. It's um, so whatever looks the most luxurious. But we still also had the idea of having the um, the ripples. Yes. Is that possible yeah. on that? You could you could uh, you could emboss it. Mm -hmm. Imagine, I mean, you've got it there where you've got a soft touch lamination and then the ripples you could do in that high gloss. I think that would be that touch that you were looking for, Sean. 
When we were designing the book, we actually took this concept of the platter and migrated them into an overall brand identity. And so we embossed the menu with ripples. We created a logo that was the brand with a fluttering maple leaf that had fallen on the water, something very typical that one sees in Canada in the fall. And then we incorporated all the elements that had gone into the food in their natural state into the menu so that you could see what were the elements that had been grown and then how they had been shaped and recooked to become a final garnish for the competition. To prepare for the Boku store, you need to practice. And it was really important for us to understand to make sure that everything we're doing is celebrating the theme of the contest. That's proper cooking, Canadian products. Are we really treating those products and bringing out the best of them? So that's number one. The pieces of food that are on the plate are the most important thing. So once we figure out all of those things are all checked off the list. Then it's about repetition. And can you get it done in the amount of time? Can you get it done under the pressure, under the environment of the contest? And with anything, I think the more that you practice, the more confidence you're gonna get out of it. We're very lucky we're able to get a consistent space to work in. To have that corner of the kitchen on our practice days where we could set up, we had dividers between us and the class that was going on around us, so we still had all that energy and that noise just beyond those dividers, but it was just us in our sort of bubble cooking these things that we'd been rehearsing. That was the closest thing we could do to replicate the competition environment. When you're sick and tired of doing that same piece of food for the 100th time, you just gotta remember that each time you do it, you're getting stronger, you're building your confidence, and ultimately on the day, you're gonna be so thankful that you put in all that time. Sorry? I don't know, all three of the Scottish is out. Sancho? Yep. We love Sancho in Canada. And you never know, right? Yeah. No. It's quite beautiful. The meat dish from Mexico, we really wanted to celebrate the suckling pig. So we tried to do that in as many ways as possible. We rule out of the pork, we wanted to make sure that we had the crispy skin. We used the pork belly with dates, as well as maple. Quebec foie gras, as well as mushroom preparations, wild mushrooms. We also made a boudin noir, which is like a blood sausage. And then we had other accompaniments, uh, Canadian, Ontario apples, wild rice, naturally harvested. It's growing all throughout the prairies. Our final fish plate that we landed on after so much trial and error and so much changing, it had our salmon piece that had canola and horseradish, our asparagus piece that was a piece of asparagus wrapped in confit kumquat, compressed yuzu apple with a pea puree on top. And then we had a really eye-catching piece that was in the shape of a clam made of sunchoke with a set clam chowder and caviar and Canadian Yukon potato. We really try to look at the whole country. We're lucky that we have so many different environments that we can get different ingredients from. It's like four, and then we narrowed it down to like three, two, and then we decided on one. So I don't know like what shape it's gonna take. I knew this was coming when I started dating him. So every year there was one or two competitions and it's just his thing. It's just what he does. Trevor competes, and that's his life, that's his world, that's his hobby. He loves it. The Boku's Door has been uh, just about a three year long journey now, and it progressively is getting a little bit more intense as the days go by. And it's been a lot of sacrifice. When I met my wife, Jessica, she knew I was a competitor. And she knew that I wanted to compete in the Boku's Door, uh, but we never really understood how long that was gonna take or you know, what kind of dedication 
that would take until it actually happens and that's when you realize this takes a big chunk out of your life. It's been a lot of sacrifice, a lot of family events missed. It's really consuming. Through our whole relationship he's been competing and I've never seen him so devoted. You have in, in your mind all the time that these other chefs, these world-renowned chefs, are, are putting in all this time and this energy. If I want to compete at that level, I have to constantly be thinking about, is my food good enough? Am I doing the right thing? How can I be better? It takes a toll. And unfortunately, my family, my wife, they're the ones that have to deal with it. I do take some time for family and my wife to do something outside of Bocuse, get away from the kitchen, get your mind off of it. It's easier said than done and it's no surprise. I mean, my family knows, you know, sometimes I'm there, but I'm not really there. So I'm thinking about it all the time. Yes, there's challenges, but I think if anything, it makes it stronger because it's so intense and you have to have such a strong support system to do something this intense. What holds it all together and gives them some comfort is that they know what I'm working towards and they know it's not permanent. There's some guilt attached to that, but I also know that this is who I am, this is my dream, and there's no turning back. Anyway, I just want to, uh, I thought it would be a good chance for us all to get together and to say uh, thank you and wish Trevor and the team going to Mexico uh, the weekend much success. Uh, it's been a long journey for Trevor. Trevor has uh, this ambition for a good few years to represent Canada in the Bucus d'Or uh, competition. And I just wanted to gather a few people together and made a big difference to the team. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, Chef Higgins and the team for inviting me to uh this auspicious occasion to wish you well, uh, you and the team well, Trevor. We are so proud of what you have accomplished. Uh, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for the hospitality and culinary team. It just never ceases to amaze me, the incredible work that you do. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for all the work and everything. It's one of the best parts of this experience has been working with all of you and the other people at the college. Um, and we really tapped into everywhere. I remember Luigi, and he's not the only person that's uh, said it to me, but uh, he said, I can see after two meetings I had with him, he said, I see you're obsessed with this competition, like very straight forward. He said, I can see, see that you're obsessed with this competition. And I took a step back. It's not the first time I've heard this. Um, but when he said that, it made me think a little bit like, you know, am I taking it too seriously? You know, is this, is this taking too much of my, my personal life, my, my career? Is, is this all worth it? I had that you know, that thought for a few seconds. Um, but then I, I really started to think about like the people that I've been able to impact and bring up, you know, the next generation of talent. Thank you so much. When I got off the plane, I was really concerned about the food. How is the food? How are we going to get it across the border, do it properly? And the platter, that's another thing. You're shipping this very peculiar, large metal case with this delicate piece of art in it. So you can imagine as a security guard in an airport, you're going to start asking some questions. So when I saw Sean, interacting with uh, some of the security guards there and the people in the airport, I was a little bit nervous. I said, oh, what if they don't accept this thing into the country? I mean, we're really in trouble.
I'm not really sure what he did. I knew that some way or another he was going to get it there. He said, you know what, if I have to drive it in from Canada, drive down to Mexico, I'll do that. I love road trips. You, you got to have one of those uh, whatever it takes mentalities. That's the only way to go about it. Setting up and preparing at the competition went really smooth for us. I was happy and everybody stepped up to the plate. As soon as we were allowed to get in the kitchen, it was just an army preparing for battle. They all came in in this sort of assembly line and set everything up so quickly, so efficiently. And we knew that we were really lucky to have that. Knowing that you have that team setting up your equipment and support, giving you that pat on the back, a little last minute encouragement, and walking into that kitchen makes a big difference. We ran into some surprises. The, the oven was not what we were expecting. It was a different oven that we had been practicing with. And that makes a big difference. The type of oven, what model it is, it all affects the cooking. How aggressive is the fan in there? How quickly does it heat up or cool down? There's all sorts of potentials for problems when you're not working with the specific ingredients. And the other factor is different elevation. You might not think about that, but Higher elevation in Mexico City causes water to boil at a different temperature. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here at the Bocuse de Or Americas. There are 11 exceptional and talented chefs. They're going to be held by De Comi and their coach. And they have precisely 5.35 hours to show their dishes. And their only five will go to the grand final in Lyon on January 2019. Cooking at the competition was different. It's always different, different environment. You've got the crowd noise in the background. Uh, you're in an unfamiliar environment. You're using products that are similar to what you were using, but maybe not identical. You may get something that's larger or smaller or has a different moisture content. Like I always say, food is uh, always different. No two, two items are ever the same. So cooking there was definitely more high pressure than our, uh, than our home kitchen. It was just assumed that we would have a third person assisting us in the kitchen. We found out a few days before we left that we weren't going to have that third person. Suddenly we had this list of things that we knew we needed to get done in that five and a half hour time span and one less person to do it all. We did not freak out at the situation. We knew it was a curveball for us, but the night before we competed, we were actually told we'd get that third person in the kitchen. So there was so much back and forth, but we were, we were ready to make whatever changes we needed while still keeping our food at its max quality that we could offer. Trevor was doing amazing. I had reset his program on the fly because he'd gone so fast. I had asked him to do some of the things that we had put aside for the commie. I think it was 35 minutes ahead of schedule. When we got to a certain stage where we caught up with time, we lost time. It came down to the crunch for us. They give you five minute grace period to send the platter. We were 20 seconds away from getting deducted points. We're about to receive the platter from Canada. Okay, so are you guys ready? During the final detail, very precise, it's a beautiful tray. La verdad, la, la bandeja de Canadá también está muy original, muy diferente. It's really, really amazing what they do. Va a salir, salir, está por salir, así es que vamos a darle un aplauso. Un aplauso, por favor, para Canadá. Canadá! Big round of applause for Canada!
to win a competition like this, you really have to bring something that is an automatic wow. When that platter goes by, it has to hit all the notes. It has to be something immediately that you know that's going to be one of the top countries. So that has to be something with a unique design that's eye-catching. When you look at the food, you can tell if it tastes good or it doesn't taste good without even tasting it. And generally when things are cooked properly, they automatically look good. The third place. Argentina! Argentina! I felt very proud. For him to come in second, I thought it was great. You're on the podium in the top five, it's a great spot to be. I really think that we set ourselves apart right off the bat, right from how we presented ourselves, our team, the dedication, our professionalism, the way we set up the kitchen. It's funny because you can almost tell what are the stronger teams and the countries before the competition even starts. We knew we had a strong team, a strong design, strong food, good flavors, good coaching. We had all the tools we needed to succeed, so we knew that we were going to do well, and podium was, was what we wanted. Obviously, everyone wants first place. But you don't want first place if you don't deserve first place. I think we, despite wanting to have a better placement, we know what we put forward and we, we were able to look at what the US did to, to get that, that top prize and what we were maybe missing, what we could do better. So we were happy with second place in that it was what we felt we deserved. Did we really deserve second place? It was a tight run. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I think second was a great placing. It was a great opportunity for Canada to get some respect in the kitchens of the Bacuus of the World Competition. Placing on the podium, getting the silver Bocuse statue in Mexico was amazing. It's such a wonderful feeling and to know that we put in all that hard work and for it to pay off and ultimately our ticket to the final in the all. That's, that's the big prize. Now that Mexico is done and sort of our, our warm-up round has, has been completed, now it's eye on the prize. We came out of that with so much more knowledge and experience under our belt. Yeah. I can't imagine going to France without having done that. The team dynamic has only gotten stronger. We're all looking towards that same thing, trying to figure out what we need to do differently, how we can be a better team, produce better food, what that means based on what we saw in Mexico, what we heard from judges and things that just sort of clicked after we competed, we're able to figure out, okay, this is the direction we need to go in. All these years, all this work, getting through the nationals, getting through the continental selection, everything leading up to this moment.
There was no rest after Mexico in preparation for Lyon. We practiced pretty much every day. We knew that it was coming. We started to work on garnishes and things like that. We all have the same mentality that the real work starts now. Um, this is the veal. We changed it. We made massive changes yesterday because they had to be done. But that's how the veal is looking now. I cooked the whole thing on on the bone. On the bone. Obviously, Thomas is also stressed. You know it. You can feel it. It needs to stop because everyone's doing their very, very best. And I know you're trying your hardest. Yeah. We need to help you help us. Okay. So we, we know we need you guys to help us with okay. the colors, the lines, so they match. Carte blanche, how you put it on. Right now, I'm struggling uh, putting all these garnishes in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we are adding more. Okay. So for that, yes, that, that's a negative point. Okay. We are adding three odd objects. We are adding two more garnishes. All of them to lock okay. it. We went with two directions. Okay. One with the uh, snow, uh, a platter full of uh, snow idea. The other one, uh, the last one that uh, we drew uh, here, uh, the idea of a lake. Okay. And uh, we both think that both of these are great designs and great directions to go. This is. Again, these are not final. We are supposed to have this next week. We can work on the arrangement. We can work on the combination, material, finishes, and everything. Okay. Not to sound like a broken record, but we have to find a way to like create drama. Like my fear is that Norway comes out with that platter, and again, it's got all this crazy stuff going on, and you just can't help yourself. But like that one's yeah. better. Because we're up against, and we're trying to do something that no Canadian's ever done is to get on the podium. You gotta do funky, weird, interesting, elevated art, math. It, it almost like a three-dimensional platter, which I think is incredibly challenging and difficult, yeah. but it could be the way to go in the mo modern version of Boku Store. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're there yet. Now we need a few days, yes. right? Yeah, we yeah. understand, trust me, it's Tuesday not easy. at the latest, I'll bring you the bill. When they decide they have to change the food in a way that represents their work better, I will follow, despite the fact that it has made difficulties for design and fabrication. The only stress that concerned me was that I met the deadlines. The challenges that we have here, first of all, let me tell you that uh, these curves, hills, uphills, downhills, okay, uh, the only way that we can achieve a good one is to make them, okay, by hand. Mm -hmm. That yeah. this feature, what was missing has been a wow, right? Yeah. That feature becomes very wow. I I test it. I test yeah. it. Yeah. This piece, we have to think of how it's impressive. I think we're getting there because we have that we framed it very beautifully. Yeah, uh, I I super duper like this moving curve. Yeah. yeah, we framed it beautifully. Okay, Team Canada, 20 minutes. I'll watch you really close and say you have a little time, you have a little time. So you can do a little nicer things, right? It took me three hours for... Uh, Jenna's has more work to do yeah. on the veal, um, so I'm going to take more work on the, uh, on the plate. We'll both get it to uh, shave in half an hour at least. That's where you're going to be. Yeah. That's where you have to be. Just like the Americans. The Americans yeah. If she goes, she has to be faster, faster, faster. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to put it 
here, like this. However you want. The presentation, whatever you want. Again, changes everything. Uh, I remember uh, you mentioned that everybody would have uh, difficulties with the wheel. It's very challenging. Yeah. So that's where all those questions yeah. uh, came up. Yeah. There were lots of challenges we faced with synchronizing the finalization of the platter and the food. You never want to compromise either. But if the food is not set, then, then you know, the platter is not set either. So finding that, really pushing on both ends to get the, the food and the platter to be the best that it could possibly be, it, it is a huge challenge. Get the very clean, and uh, you don't have the holes and the gap like that. That that the judge will nail yeah, you for like, big time. And point. you're talking about yeah. the gap here. The, yeah, the yeah. gap and the the inside here. And I know the workmanship's there, brother. Don't I see workmanship. you work that in the fine brimoise, and you're adding tons of flavor. And don't stop. But I think you can maybe simplify some of the things you're doing, and keep it a little bit cleaner to get the, get a better re result. We want you to be able to cook as natural as you can. So the food is spectacular. The moment you start manipulating food, it starts it stops tasting good. Come on, let's be honest. The most simple cooking techniques are the best flavors. That's why Boku's is hard because you they ask you to cook spectacular food in a modern way, but you have to keep those proper techniques going without too destroying them. You know, and it's hard because I know your heart and loves in this, and we're not trying to destroy it. We want you to sit in the podium, brother. Okay. You gotta look at this this way, guys. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when you think I went to Boku's door, did I take every risk I could take? Like, if you do really good work and you came 11th, 12th, is that gonna give you the same feeling? Or I cooked, I kicked some ass that day. They tasted something they didn't taste before. I'm, I don't agree with that. Very frankly. Yeah, it's just not feeling elegant. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I get your point. And you talk about from uh, chef uh, perspective, point of view. But uh, design elements are uh, things that comes from uh, psychology of all people, okay. not only designers. Okay. It's, it's not something that uh, we create or we, we uh, say they should be like that. It's like when people put the powder up, it was absolutely perfect. Like that was perfect. Now they're abstract a little more, so I'm with you guys. But there's nowhere platter was empty, all this empty space. I would look at it and say, they didn't figure it out. That's what I see when I see that. They didn't figure it out. And I'd dismiss the platter. Like this was all too crunched. We were feeling, right? Yeah. So maybe we need to decrunch it. But to jump to that other thing, to me that other thing is a losing platter. It's not a platter that I would go, wow. Yeah. It's, I would, it, it, it and would I be would the opposite. See, I'd I look at it and say, did they just throw it all on there? The constant change made it difficult for a design to finally be nailed down. Being on this team meant never settling for anything. So everyone involved was sort of aware that we were going to keep pushing, we were going to keep changing things. Sean is at the end of the rope, I, and realistically for a reason too, because he realizes we only have like five, six weeks to make this tray. Yeah. So I'm hoping that we decide something because otherwise I don't think he feels that he can make it. So for what? Hey. Okay. So what we did is we sat there last night 
and we tried to incorporate the ideas that like you know because we were all over the place and so I sat with Sean and we we went through it and because he thought like we have to throw everything out and I said no Sean you know and he was really worried about like can we even make it in time if we're going to redesign too much I said no I think we just have to incorporate some of the key ideas that you guys had I'm not gonna lie I, I agree everyone what you guys all like but I still like this too yeah and to me stuff. any one of these is good Right. Jenna, if you had to decide to today. This one. Well, I think Sean's going to be relieved, relieved and grateful. Yeah. And because I, I do think it is a, a big challenge uh, over the next uh, month to be able to realize this. As a team, I try to support the chef. I was confident in what we were doing. I just didn't want to deliver something with low quality. There was no limit really to how much we could change the food. We decided on ingredients and flavors, maybe techniques we wanted to show, but rounding each of that, everything was still sort of up in the air. We'd work on 20 concepts and maybe two would make it to the next round. There was that constant desire for all of our food to be perfect. And because that perfection doesn't really exist, that you just keep pushing for a higher standard. And there was no settling on what we were doing. I like the idea of like a pressed dill, like dehydrated. Like if we put some weight on it, so we had a flat piece that sat right on top. Yeah. So it's like fanned out, but like flat and yeah. crispy almost. Yeah. I had help from uh, external sources shops and internal helpers as well. So you can see here, it's like a rolling list of uh, the geometry surface. So there's 85,000 lines of, of dimension, and we're at 53 now. I used the common area of Maker Lab at the school and students are using the same space. We ran into a little bit of conflict <laughs> with each other. When I was doing the, the final coating on the platter and uh, left it to get dry and put all the signs, please do not touch. Then after one hour, I went back to check on the work and I noticed that uh, students unfortunately sprayed glue on <laughs> all the platters. So next two, three days <laughs> was uh, me sanding down the whole platter <laughs> and recoating it all over again. <laughs> Changing the food is an ongoing process. There are always things that can be improved and things that just don't simply work. That's probably the biggest challenge in the Boku stores is, is committing to a garnish. And just because you nailed it last week doesn't mean you're not going to have problems the following week because food is, is so different. Products are changing all the time. There may be a product that's available last week. It's not available this week. Also, the flavor is changing constantly. So to fully commit to something is very challenging. And it's something that really happens almost right up until the end. We wanted to use Canadian ingredients to show Canada in its best light. We're looking at things that our farmers are really well known for, some foraged ingredients. 
We had a carrot that was cooked in veal bone marrow fat, a pea mosaic, which was a slice of braised artichoke with an oxtail gelée, and then a veal liver mousse, a pickled pearl onion, and then we served a crispy sweetbread, which was essentially blanched sweetbreads bound with mushroom mousse and then breaded and fried and sliced. I did sacrifice a lot. I was here working on the platter almost uh, non-stop over the holidays. Without that, we wouldn't have had the platter. On our chartreuse plate, we were working with what would have been seasonal in Canada at the time. We had to use vegetables from the metro market. If you're looking at winter in Canada, we'd be using root vegetables, we'd be using beets, parsnips, radishes. We wanted to bring that story with us and represent seasonality of our produce. For the fish plate, we did a roasted parsnip with chestnut and mushroom. We had a broccoli and kohlrabi garnish. Pickled beetroot with ice wine and horseradish. Vegetable and shellfish chartreuse with potato, root vegetables, and egg yolk. You're working better today than you did two practices ago. So long as you know the program, you're fine. Seven minutes to go, okay? So you have 10 minutes in Canada, so I'm telling you to you have time. Like perfect. So 45 seconds in Canada. Okay, you guys can start grabbing things. It's nice with the meat and the parsley too. That's so good. Even if they have it with the chartreuse somehow. The beetroot is just it's good rice. Right? Smells, it's good. We were all expecting to fly out on the same flight. And Sean was not there with us when we checked in, when we got through security, when we were at the gate. And you start to suspect that something's not going right. Getting talked to by customs. This pattern is beautiful, though, say. When we didn't see Sean at the airport, it was stressful. When we were supposed to fly to France with uh, the rest of the team members, we got to the airport and I noticed that the manager at the counter is trying somehow to refuse to accept the platter without giving any reason. I got some calls from the, the airport. It was almost matey, 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 the stress here. Sean's not getting on the plane with a platter. And I was like, holy smokes. And everyone was like, what did we do next? There was no one anticipated this. This was like, Sean wasn't going to make the plane. They refused the platter, so I went back home.
We stayed in a little private school in Belon. Maybe 20 minutes away from Lyon, where the competition is held. Oh, this is older than, uh, it's a beautiful building with a lot of history. Uh, I believe it's older than uh, Canada, actually. Watch your head when you come up. Yeah. It was very bare bones. It was kind of cool, actually. It was an old building in this quiet town in France. And you just don't have places like that here. So I was sort of enamored by it, actually. <laughs> But it did come with its difficulties. We didn't have keys for all of the rooms for the first two days. We didn't have Wi-Fi. They forgot to feed us for the first couple of days as well until we took it upon ourselves to cook our own meals. The showers were either freezing cold or boiling hot. That, that's what you got. Six o'clock in the morning, half past five in the morning, you're going for a shower, you want some hot water, and you get a cold stuff over your head. Not very good. At the end of the day, we had a kitchen to train in, we had space to keep our stuff and get organized, and we had beds to sleep in. So pretty much that was all that we needed. We just focused on our task at hand. We weren't concerned about the fact that we were sort of on this island in, in the middle of a rural town in France. We were a little bit behind the eight ball. We needed to pick up the pace. We hadn't got an opportunity to work with all the products and we hadn't had a chance to put the food on the platter. So that was a major challenge. Hopefully everything is okay and everything is in place, nothing's broken and we're good to go. I had this feeling something happened, it's this huge platter, we're trying to get on an aircraft. It's difficult to explain. This weird custom metal piece with wires and all these things. Perfect. I had a feeling that he would get there, and, and of course he did. So this is the uh, kitchen. Okay. Hey, Jenna. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, you made it. You made it. <laughs> you had a hard time. I heard. No, I know. You've come through. <laughs> The inspiration for uh, the new platter actually was in the previous platter, the platter we use in Mexico. In fact, it depicted the same scenery in the Canadian landscape and we depicted a lake for the platter in Mexico and we imagine now that it's winter, it's full of snow. to capture walking into a farm in the winter in Canada. Whoa. Wow. 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 Oh my gosh. You can like see our food on it. Cast this one. So under here. The if this mm. is not strong enough, I don't know. It's not strong enough. It's not. Okay. 
And when the food goes on, well, I think it's gonna look totally amazing and different again. Definitely unique. And mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like that. I'm on a winter farm. <laughs> this is by far our best potter we ever had. By far. Yeah, I think so. I don't think anyone's come close. It is beautiful. That's a good way to describe it. Until you go there and you test the products, they're, they're just different, a lot of them, the proteins, the vegetables. Uh, so we had to make some adjustments there. Um, and then we, when we actually got to put the food onto the platter, that's when we started to notice some things that needed to be tweaked. We had a few long nights there, dealing with certain changes in the menu. We suddenly saw that we had three garnishes that had white and green on them, plus an orange carrot on the outside. It was this moment of, okay, we need to change this. What are we gonna do? We have five days until we compete. What, what can we do to push all of this to the level we want it to be at? Nick built these incredible, inedible forage decorations to also go on the platter to fill it out a little bit more. So those were things that we didn't know we needed to get done in France, but obviously there were going to be changes that needed to be made. We just didn't know what they were until we got there. And even oh, like, yeah. this is rough, like it's, it's not perfect. Like we have to literally find like yep. the perfect ones. The only question I have for you is when you put the chartreuse down, then you want to put the flowers down? Yeah. Last second, pop the okay. flowers in here. These are strong, strong on their own. Yeah. Powerful, and these are like. Okay, this is this is complete. Yes. These are complete. These, yeah, you're right. It's not complete. It's interesting, eh? But it should be complete. I know it's late now, but something metal or something that like comes up like a spiral behind it or. Tim asked me to change a few things on the platter while we were done in Leon. It was very challenging. It took a lot of time. I stayed up till 1 a.m., 2 a.m. for several days. Normally what happens is you have the, the game plan. It's scripted before you even get on the plane. The last night, the game plan was still being perfected. Nick, for instance, was out getting some wild grass. So this was like right up until the very, very end. Sean was perfecting the platter. There was a lot of problems with the platter, trying to, to solve. And I would have said, really, the platter wasn't finished until the next morning before it left for the show uh, in Lyon. So this was like right up into the wire. This was like the checkered flag. It was almost ready to be dropped and the platter was finished. Amen. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. Uh, Team Canada. Oui, Canada, yeah. Ouais. yeah. When we arrived at the competition, the first thing you have to do is set up the kitchen, which is nerve wracking. It's a kitchen that you've never been in before, so you're assuming that things are gonna fit a certain way and the spacing is gonna be 
a certain way, but there's logistical challenges when you're setting up that, that are stressful. It was really quite an experience going up against Robert Slatiki, even though he was a coach. I just remember as a kid watching him compete for Canada. That was a cool moment. One, go! Cooking in the final in Lyon was much more grand, a lot more people there. It felt a great amount of support there. We had almost 100 Canadians up in the cheering stands, Canadian flags waving like crazy. Nothing can prepare you for the, the noise. It's difficult to hear what somebody's saying five feet in front of you. It's that loud in there. Bright lights and the unfamiliar kitchen, pretty nerve wracking. My station, half an hour into the contest, my power was gone. We had a couple technicians come in, try and fix it. Your team are disconnect this. You, you have a, a plug, big plug. If you have, I can reconnect. Trevor didn't have any power on his station aside from the burners, so anytime he needed to use a blender or a food processor, he needed to come over to my station. Then the vacuum sealer behind me at one point stopped working because the, the power had, had shut off there. Someone from the competition came in to ask if I wanted it fixed, but I needed it fixed yesterday, so. So we made it work. No worries, you're doing great, Ben. Doing the competition without having Paul Bocuse around was unusual. I remember going to the competition years back and seeing him there, but it was sad that he wasn't there. It was sad, but you know something? He's still, he's still alive. The competition is Paul Bocuse. And there were so many chefs who came from all over the world and I really appreciate what he done and what he has done for the profession. He wasn't there in the flesh, but he definitely was there in spirit. This is the first edition without my father, and yes, it was a lot of emotion, but just the fact that you're here, all of you, the supporter, the chef, the candidates, showing what you did during the last two days was the best tribute you could have done to my father. From the bottom of my heart, thank you.
seeing the platter, seeing all of our food on it just before putting it out was very exciting. That was really the first time that we had seen it in that setting with the atmosphere around us. But at the same time, it was just like, get all the food on. You need to pass it off because you need them to pass it so that we can go to the station and carve. And there was always something else to worry about. So we looked at it, did a final sweep of the whole thing to make sure we were happy with it. And then we sent it off. It was such a fleeting moment. The product just passed you like a TGV train. It just flies past you. You want to see the products, you don't want to see the quality because you want to have an opinion on the results of the final five or ten countries at the end. But you don't get much time. I wish it could take longer. But you know something? The food has to be served hot. The feeling when the platter went up and it was about to go to the judges was pretty incredible. We were really happy about it. You know, Regis Macomb, the announcer right away, said he wanted to put his, his thoughts in on what he saw. He described it as when you're flying over Canada and you're about to land, you see all of the fields with the, the frozen wheat and, and it, it looked as if you were flying over the prairies. They should use it as a, a last minute a ragu, for instance. Thank you, that's all yeah, you noticed. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. I said, I'm very hungry. Ils le sont appris par cœur depuis. This is the moment that everybody's been waiting for. Bronze calls, and it's Norway. Amazing job. Everybody's super excited for them. It's always nerve-wracking. I'm sure everybody is sitting there sweating in their boots. It's actually a little bit more nerve-wracking than competition itself in some ways. Shall we be giving out silver? Sweden came in at second, no surprises there. Strong team, strong foundation, good food. The level of competition is incredible. The depth of experience and infrastructure of some of the teams is remarkable. the Bakus door this year. We need a lot of help for this magnificent moment. How did I feel when the results got read out? Empty, sad, sad not for me. I felt sad for the team. I felt sad for everyone who helped us along the way. I mean, I really wanted top 10. We were expecting higher. It, it was a kind of general feeling. We're super proud. We're a young organization. We, we did everything we possibly could. So there's no regrets in, in among anybody on the team. It would have been great to, to see us ranking higher. We aimed for the podium, and if we hadn't aimed for the podium, then we would have ranked lower anyways. Everything that leads up to success is hard. It's about the challenge that gets you 
to where you want to go. I was very, very, very disappointed. And there was no feedback given to any of the countries. Well, you can't excel at something you don't know. It's like hitting a wall all the time. Someone's putting an obstacle in front of you. And these other teams are so far ahead, you're never going to catch up. But you know something? It's one competition, but the most important thing now is we get up and we get ready for the next one. I started on this journey training for the Boku Store, working at George Brown College with the students every day. It's something that I absolutely love. And taking such a big chunk of time was a sacrifice in its own because I really do love my job. I'm so happy to be back. Being able to translate some of the things that I've learned through this journey has taken some time to reflect and think about how can this experience value to students. And, and the biggest thing that I've learned and that I can share with them is to really follow your dream and have great goals and, and shoot for the stars. Even though we didn't make the podium, which is what we always set out to do, we were very determined in that. It's not necessarily a failure. You, you're only considered a failure if you don't get up. As long as you keep pushing forward and you're looking towards the next thing and you become a better chef and a better person, I think that's what it's all about. the Goku Store competition, which is a huge thing. We're very excited. We are going to watch Canada's top culinary talent face off against one another right here on the stage for a chance to represent Canada at what is the most prestigious gastronomic contest in the entire world. I was chosen to be a judge on the new national selection. It was a logical decision. I had just been there. I have some idea what they're looking for. I had gone through the process. I can look at chefs and, and see where the strengths and weaknesses are, particularly towards Boku Store. Felt a little bit strange to be on the other side of the table for the tasting of the next Canadian selection. But it felt great to see some other chefs that were excited about competing in the Boku store. I was looking for the chef that had potential and really wanted it. Samuel Siro. I really hope that I've laid some groundwork for the next candidate and, and future teams, that we've inspired other Canadian chefs to, to compete at this level. It is very important for us. We wanted to make sure that we weren't in it just for this two-year period because we know that in order for us to, to really move up the ranks, we have to build the team but also nurture what we've already worked on. was so demanding and so all-consuming. I was so grateful to be a part of it. Every time I came to train here and work with this team of people, I was learning something new, and I was so grateful for that opportunity. My dream was always to learn as much as I could, and Bocuse was a wonderful way for me to start that journey. Paul Bocuse has left a, an extraordinary legacy for the culinary arts. He's a chef that everybody respects. The reason we can be thankful for him was that he was the one that wanted the chefs to get out of the kitchen and put them in the spotlight. Paul Bocuse was one of my heroes. 
if he was here today, I'd just uh, like to I'd give him a big hug, actually, and I'm not a huggy person, but I'd give him a big hug and say thank you for, for doing this and, and for him putting the time and the effort. If he was still here, I would say, merci, chef. Thank you for making this amazing competition and for inspiring me and my team. It's truly an honor to meet you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. There's so much you could say, but the biggest thing is thank you, just because he ignited this force of gastronomy around the world and created this stage for chefs to be tested on and brought us out into the spotlight rather than just in the depths of the kitchen. So, yeah, there's nothing else to say but thank you. Thank you.